Um, good afternoon, Red Sox Nation. <laughs> um, I, uh, that, we won the World Series at home for the first time in nearly a century, a, a historical event. And speaking of history, I'd like to take you back to 1989. The number one song that year was Miss You Much by Janet Jackson. President George H.W. Bush was inaugurated as president. The Iron Curtain fell. History will note all of these things. But in addition, I gave my first talk to this organization <laughs> in 1989. How many of you were here for that first Well, Ken was, Bonnie, I think, was. Yes, Lucy was. Um, and none of us looks a day older, right? Yes. Okay. How many of you remember what the field of medical research was and, and knowledge of CFS by practicing physicians in 1989? It was pretty non-existent. There had been some media coverage. The words chronic fatigue syndrome, for better and for worse, had become uh, perceptible in the practicing medical community. But we really knew next to nothing about it as an illness. And that was a huge problem because the illness itself is defined exclusively by a set of symptoms. And so many physicians, many scientists said, uh, you know, anyone can say they have symptoms. Uh, what's the evidence that there is an underlying biological process going on in people with this illness that explains those symptoms? And there was no good answer to that question in 1989 because there was not much evidence of an underlying biological process. What I want to do today um, is say that by now, nearly a quarter century later, I think it's pretty clear that there are, in many, um, most patients with CFS, measurable abnormalities that involve the brain and the nerves, uh, the immune system, and energy metabolism. In many patients, there is an initial infectious-like illness that occurs at the beginning, uh, but not all. But that initial beginning for many people suggests the possibility that the illness has been triggered, at least, by some sort of an infection. Multiple different infectious agents, not a single novel agent, have been linked to CFS in many but not all patients. And though none of them is a proven cause of the illness, uh, there is pretty strong evidence that several of them are associated with the illness. One and possibly two new treatments have been studied scientifically with encouraging results. I'll come to that at the end. There are today in contrast to 1989, new technologies available to laboratory scientists that can determine the structure of genes, whether specific genes are turned on or off, and these are all now being used to study CFS. And finally, there is growing interest in the illness from scientists all around the world. Over 5,000 scientific articles have been published. Over 300 of the very most prestigious journals of medicine and biological science. Ten international research conferences, the last of which had over 160 scientific presentations from scientists all over the world. The next such conference in San Francisco next March. At the National Institutes of Health, at the direction of the head of the National Institutes of Health, in 2011, there was a two-day conference focused exclusively on chronic fatigue syndrome. Very few illnesses have been singled out for uh, that kind of attention 
uh, focused attention at a conference at the NIH in the last few years. And the CDC survey of U.S. physicians finds that today virtually all of them have heard of chronic fatigue syndrome and 40% say they've seen patients with the illness in their practice. A huge change from 1989. I want to start by talking about the severity of CFS. And I will be mixing today some old news that many of you may have seen before uh, and what I regard as some of the most interesting new research. This was a study that we did uh, 15 years ago using an instrument called the SF36, a survey instrument that now probably is the most widely used um, technique for assessing at what level people are functioning, regardless of what disease they have or how they're functioning even if they have no disease. And that tool has a group of different scores, eight different scores. Uh, they're down here at the bottom. And to simplify a complicated slide, the, with each of these scores, the higher the score, the better the person's level of function, the lower, the worse. Here, in a large study that compares 2,500 people from the general population who were healthy, many hundreds of people with heart failure, 500 people with major depression, and 200 people with chronic fatigue syndrome, you can see that on most of these scales, the patients with chronic fatigue syndrome were functioning at a lower level than, certainly a much lower level than the healthy population, and at a lower level than patients with heart failure and major depression. The only exception was on the two scales that reflect uh, emotional disturbance, the CFS patients were not significantly different from healthy people, whereas they were very different from the depressed people. CDC did a study about 10 years ago trying to estimate how much lost productivity there is to the economy from CFS. They conducted a survey of 56,000 people uh, and they documented that for people with this illness there was a 37% decline in household productivity, 54% reduction in labor force productivity, and the total cost to the U.S. economy each year from lost productivity was about $9 billion. No, none of the costs for medical care for these people uh, or, or, in, or supportive care, home supportive services, are included in those numbers. If you add those numbers, the cost goes up to closer to $20 billion. So it's a substantial problem for the economy in addition to the suffering for those people who have it. So as I said at the beginning, the, the questions from the very get-go with chronic fatigue have been, uh, are there objective biological markers that are abnormal in this illness? And do we understand how the symptoms of the illness are caused? And my own summary from my talk today is that the answer to these two questions is, yes, there surely are. And no, we don't know definitively, but we're beginning to get evidence as to what's going on. The body clearly is affected in this illness in different ways. The brain, the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, which comes from the brain and controls what are called the vital functions of the body, heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, function of the bowels, uh, these two systems clearly have abnormalities that can be measured. The immune system is in a state of chronic activation. There are multiple pieces of evidence that the energy that is being made inside cells is abnormal. Genetic studies reveal a genetic link to this illness, 
And a number, as I said at the beginning, of infectious agents have been associated with the illness, although none is a proven cause. So let's start with the brain. Thousands of studies have concluded looking at the brain in, many, in totally different ways, using totally different technologies to look at aspects of the brain, have, come, have revealed abnormalities. The brain has a set of cells that make hormones. Those hormones create signaling or communication within the brain. They also travel through the blood to affect other organs of the body. There is impairment of multiple of these neuroendocrine systems in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Studies of cognition, different kinds of studies of different kinds of thinking have revealed impairments in information processing speed and in memory and attention that are not explained by any concomitant psychiatric disorders people may have. Autonomic dysfunction, the autonomic nervous system, uh, has impairment in both of its two arms, the sympathetic and parasympathetic arms, in the majority of patients in most studies. By MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, there are areas of high signal in the white matter of the brain, areas of abnormality in the white matter of the brain uh, in most of the studies of, that, of CFS using that technology. Using another imaging technology, SPECT scanning, there are areas of reduced signal that most likely ref reflect reduced blood flow or metabolism or both in different parts of the brain. And then finally, using electrical studies to measure the electrical brain waves in patients with CFS, a number of abnormalities have been identified, and I'll summarize a few of them in, in just the next few minutes. One of the difficulties of, uh, with studying the brain in any illness, any human illness, is that you don't want to invade the brain. Uh, you, you, it, you, the brain is inside a bony box. It's awfully hard to study the brain without invading it. Now, some of these imaging technologies that I've just mentioned have, in the last 20, 30 years, allowed us to see inside the brain in ways that we couldn't before. But we're still looking largely at anatomy and gross physiology. It's much harder, for instance, to look for particular infectious agents inside the human brain without invading the brain. One way of indirectly looking at what's going on in the brain is to study the spinal fluid. And when a spinal tap is done, you, you take out of the area around the spinal cord a, a sample of fluid. That fluid is bathing not only the spinal cord, but also the brain. And what you see in the fluid reflects to some extent, what's happening in the brain. A group uh, five years ago did a study, um, I guess eight years ago, did a study of CFS patients versus healthy controls using spinal fluid. And they were looking for differences in proteins inside the spinal fluid in the patients using a technique, mass spectroscopy, that is the scientific gold standard for measuring for identifying proteins. What they found were a group of proteins that were f quite frequently seen in CFS patients and never seen in healthy patients. And these proteins are proteins involved in uh, responding to infection, inflammation, and in dealing with the oxidative stress that happens in infections. Another way of looking or studying the spinal fluid involves measuring the amount of lactic acid in the spinal fluid. And in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, 
those levels are much higher than they are in people with chronic anxiety disorders or healthy individuals. Another biological piece of evidence that there's something not right in the brain. Study that we published uh, two years ago used EEG uh, brainwave studies, a special kind of analysis of the brainwaves called spectral coherence. This was done with my colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Duffy at Children's Hospital. And basically what we found was that using this analytic technique, we could accurately classify nearly 90% of CFS patients and identify them as having a different pattern from people who were healthy or people who had major depression. In fact, there was a perfect separation between chronic fatigue syndrome and major depression in this study. So another piece of biological evidence that there is something physical, organic going on, biological going on in people with chronic fatigue syndrome that distinguishes them from healthy individuals and individuals with other diseases that can cause fatigue, like depression. Um, Dr. Alan Light at the University of Utah uh, did a very interesting study uh, four years ago. He studies the molecules that mediate the sensation of pain and fatigue in animals in man. And since patients with chronic fatigue syndrome complain of m much more pain and fatigue than healthy individuals, he tried to see whether studying these molecules in people with CFS would distinguish them from people who were healthy. And he did it after a stressor. As many of you I know, uh, know from experience, physical exertion can prompt relapses uh, or worsening of the illness. And so what he did was study patients with CFS and healthy individuals following an exercise stress test. These were the molecules that he studied, the molecules that are used by the brain to perceive pain and fatigue. Each molecule is coded differently uh, with a different color. First, they studied the healthy individuals, and they studied them at different time periods. They studied them at baseline before they had exercised, and then 30 minutes, 8 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours after the exercise. And what you see is that if you compare post-exercise to pre-exercise, there were a few molecules that exercise seemed to bump up in healthy individuals. And then he did exactly the same thing in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. You don't need to do statistical tests uh, to tell that that's a difference. Uh, many of these molecules were what biologists would call upregulated in response to exercise among the CFS patients in contrast to the healthy individuals. So in summary, um, in talking about the brain in CFS, many different techniques for looking at the brain all say there's something wrong. They don't say that the problem is a permanent or a progressive condition, but there's something measurable that's wrong. That in those studies that have repeated the study in people with CFS over time, find those abnormalities sort of wax and wane. They're not permanent, but they're definitely dis distinctive when you compare the same studies in healthy people. The cause of the problems in the brain remains obscure. Infection of the brain and, and the nerves, or the tissues around the nerves of the brain, um, is a plausible possibility, but not proven. 
an immune system attack on parts of the brain, uh, triggered by who knows what, uh, possibly an infection, possibly other things, is another plausible po possibility. But 1989, there wasn't a shred of evidence that there was anything wrong in the brain. The immune system. There have been nearly a thousand studies of the immune system. Um, my attempt to capture what they say is as follows. There are white blood cells called T lymphocytes or cytotoxic T lymphocytes that are activated in chronic fatigue syndrome. When the immune system is responding to an attack on something, it changes, the cells of the immune system change the markers that display on their surface. It's like they're wearing little flags saying we're going into battle. Uh, and you can measure those markers and you can look at how many activated cells of this type there are in chronic fatigue syndrome versus healthy individuals. And there are more in chronic fatigue syndrome. The one kind of white blood cell, immune system cell, called natural killer cells, are functioning very poorly in chronic fatigue syndrome. Why is not clear. Are they infected themselves, or are they simply engaged in such a long, tough struggle that they're getting tired? We just don't know. There is a particular immune system response to viral infection called the 2,5-A system that is turned on in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And then finally, the chemicals, the molecules that are used by the immune system to orchestrate the immune attack in any kind of infection are increased in chronic fatigue syndrome. That were several of the key molecules. That doesn't mean that there is an infection that they're responding to, but it could. So, in summary, the immune system in CFS has been activated in several different parts of the immune system in patients with CFS. What has activated the immune system is unclear with infectious agents being a plausible possibility. This immune system activation inner near the brain and the nerves that come from the brain could explain many of the symptoms of CFS, uh, particularly this hypothesis that infection of cells around the nerves of the brain, particularly the largest nerve called the vagus nerve, uh, has recently been put forward as a possible explanation for the symptoms in chronic fatigue syndrome. It's a tough thing to study in living human beings, but, but we're engaged in, with colleagues at the Harvard Medical School and Tufts to see whether we can study that. Energy metabolism in CFS. When I first heard this, this scientific hypothesis that maybe the problem in people who are tired is, or people who don't have enough energy, is that their cells are not able to make enough energy. I thought that was pretty simplistic. Um, but I think I was wrong, because there are now many hundreds of papers that show that indeed our cells, at least the cells that are easily, we're easily able to study, do have problems manufacturing the molecules that give our cells energy and hence give us energy. There is a defective production of these molecules demonstrated in several studies. The key battery packs inside each cell called the mitochondria appear to be abnormal in a number of studies uh, of CFS patients. And finally, uh, something called, that I alluded to earlier, oxidative stress, which is common, uh, is common part of the response to infection, uh, can damage mitochondria, can cause energy problems, and there's very strong evidence of oxidative stress in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. 
here are some markers of oxidative stress. Uh, one molecule, high density lipoprotein cholesterol, is lower in oxidative stress, and in fact, it's lower in patients with CFS in the blue compared with healthy individuals. Two other molecules, when they're up, are markers of oxidative stress, are higher in CFS than in healthy individuals. What about gene abnormalities? Our whole understanding of sort of what the genetic basis of disease is, I would argue in the last 15 years, has been not turned on its head, but um, made much more complicated. Uh, and I'll try to explain why, but also explain why that's important. Many years ago, the very first disease that was shown to be caused by a defect in how a gene was built back in the 1950s was a disease called sickle cell anemia. And the uh, famous biochemist, Linus Pauling, showed that a single defect in the gene for globin, part of, of blood cells, part of hemoglobin, a molecule inside red blood cells. A single defect in that gene was the cause of sickle cell anemia. And this was a landmark discovery in medicine, and it encouraged many people to believe that basically all gene, all disease would be shown ultimately to be caused by a specific defect in a specific gene. And the search was underway for a lot of those defects. And a number of examples exist. But we now know it's much more complicated than that. That most of the most important diseases, like high blood pressure or high cholesterol, atherosclerosis, many cancers, seem to be a function of defects in multiple genes, not just a single gene. Uh, and it's even more complicated than that because multiple different kinds of defects in the same gene can do the same, can cause the same uh, increase in vulnerability to disease. But the whole goal of the Human Genome Project was to understand how every single human gene was built in the hopes that once we understood that, we would begin to understand more and more diseases. So this is a return to high school biology, and unnecessary, I'm sure, for a number of you, but, but I, it's important to reinforce this. So genes are made of DNA. DNA is like a string of pearls. Uh, the pearls, in this case, are uh, bases. Um, but the DNA makes a copy of itself in slightly different bases that is called messenger RNA. And this, so this string of pearls encodes and determines the shape of this string of pearls. And then this goes on to make proteins, which are another kind of string of pearls that are determined exactly by what the constitution of this string of pearls is. So it, the concept, the central dogma, so-called, of molecular biology was that it, it's really simple. All of life is determined by DNA making messenger RNA, making protein, and once you understand aberrations in that process, you'll understand disease. So here's an example uh, of a defect in the gene that leads to a change in the messenger RNA, that leads to a change in the protein, and that protein because it's now built differently, behaves differently, and affects or determines the presence of a disease. If only it were that simple. Back in 1999, now this is a decade after I first came to speak to this group, uh, we knew a few genes. We knew how they were built, a few genes. Today, we know every single one of the nearly 22,000 genes and how they're built. 
back in 1999, we could link a gene with a disease, but it was an extremely time-consuming, laborious process. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. With advancements in various technologies, it's thousands of times easier to link a particular gene to a particular disease. And back in 1999, we could do more than study how genes were built. We could study how they were turned on. Why is that important? If you think about it, every cell in our body has exactly the same set of genes. The cell in your stomach that's pumping out acid to digest food has the same genes exactly as the cell in the back of your eye that sees light. But those two cells look entirely different under the microscope. They do entirely different things. Fortunately, the cells in the back of your eye are not making acid, otherwise that would be a problem. <laughs> uh, so how can that be if these cells have exactly the same genes, but the cells are so different? Well, how it can be is that what really matters is not just how a gene is built, but in a particular cell, which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off. And abnormalities in that, even if genes are built perfectly normally, if a gene in a cell should be turned on right now, but it's not, or if it should be turned off, but it's not, that can cause disease. So it's not just how genes are built, it's whether they're turned on or not. And that was a nearly impossible task. It was totally impossible in 1999 to say which genes exactly in this group of cells, let's say a piece of liver cancer, or white blood cells from patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Which genes are turned on and off in those cells? It was a pipe dream to imagine that you could get an answer to that question. Today, people are doing it every day. And that not only has profoundly improved uh, studies of many diseases, but it is influencing CFS research. And there is uh, a genetic component to chronic fatigue syndrome. It's not determinative. Um, that is, most genetically influenced diseases, does, you're not guaranteed getting a disease if a parent had it, or if you're not guaranteed getting a disease if you inherit a disease gene from your parents, but, but it increases your vulnerability to getting a disease. And the evidence for that, it comes from different kinds of studies. There is a significantly increased prevalence of certain um, genes that are, that are commonly studied to look for genetic basis for disease in CFS. There are twin studies where identical twins and non-identical twins are studied that allow you to ask the question, how much of whatever disease it is you're studying is genetic? Because obviously identical twins should have a higher, if there is a genetic component, they should have a higher frequency of the disease. And such studies do show that uh, a substantial part of uh, getting CFS seems to be determined by genes. Not all, but a substantial part. Turning to whether genes are turned on and off, that technologies that now allow us to do that are certainly being used in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And what they have shown is that there are abnormalities, not in how the genes are built, but in whether they're turned on or off, in genes that involve immune activation, energy metabolism, neurohormones in the, involved in the stress response, that they're all activated more often in CFS. So in other, in other words, uh, the genetic studies reinforce what previous studies had shown about immune activation, energy metabolism, and neurohormones. So, in summary, a few genes may be built differently in people with CFS uh, and have probably been inherited, although some genetic changes occur after inheritance. Uh, 
And in patients with CFS, there are differences in what genes are turned on and off, even when those genes are built normally. What about infections? I want to discuss a couple of concepts because, uh, like everything, in infection and whether you're infected or not is not so, such a simple thing to think about. Most of the infections that we get as human beings come and go. An infectious agent enters our body, our immune system responds, ultimately that infectious agent is wiped out and eliminated from our body. That same agent may infect us again in the future, although the immune response generally diminishes that chance, but most infections come and go. However, quite a number of infections come and stay. There, in particularly with viruses, there are many viruses that once a human being becomes infected with them, remain inside that human being ineradicable for the rest of that person's life. Now, in fact, most of us right now in this room, 90% of us are infected by two or three viruses and have been since we were children. And those viruses are permanently inside us. But the real question is not whether they're there, but whether they're active. Whether, even though the immune system can't eradicate them, whether our immune systems are keeping them in check, keeping them down. And in most of us, they are. A cold sore is a good example. The herpes simplex virus that causes a cold sore stays in your body for the rest of your life. But it only causes that cold sore now and then. It's always there. As you know, it, the cold sore comes back. And it often comes back in the same place. Uh, but it's not, uh, but, it, but it is there most of the time in a quiet form that you don't even know. What, yeah, I'm gonna make the distinction between infections that trigger an illness and perpetuate an illness. What I mean by that is an infectious agent could enter the body, could cause the immune system to react, and could somehow disrupt the normal function of the immune system. It is possible, and it happens in animals, that some infectious agents enter the body, the immune system responds, the agent is eradicated, but it unbalances that infectious agent and the fight against it, unbalances the immune system, and the immune system is not quite right for a long time, maybe for the rest of that animal's life. That almost surely can happen in humans, and there are some people who believe that in CFS, that's probably what has happened that a group of different infectious agents come in and they somehow destabilize or unbalance the immune system in the immune system's attempt to eradicate them. Those who believe that CFS might be caused by agents that not only trigger but perpetuate the illness argue that uh, particularly with those kinds of agents that have the ability to stay in your body for the rest of their life, it's more plausible that the infectious agent is still there and still part of the reason that you have symptoms years after it first entered your body. Either of these things could be right. As a general theory, either of them could be right in a given individual, and some people the CFS may have been caused by a triggering agent that unbalanced the immune system. In another person, it may be caused by an agent that continues to cause trouble and cause symptoms from the immune response. The other um, sort of oversimplification about infectious diseases is that many infectious diseases uh, are not caused just by a single novel agent. There are exceptions. Certainly AIDS is a clear exception where one virus is absolutely essential to have AIDS. Now, it may be that other infectious agents 
tend to make AIDS more severe or less severe, but HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is a novel agent and essential for AIDS. But most illnesses that are caused by infectious agents can be caused by multiple infectious agents. If you didn't have the lab tests to know that, you wouldn't know. The common cold is the best example. There are hundreds of viruses that cause the common cold. And you can't tell, and your doctor never does the tests to tell which one it is, because fortunately, if it's the common cold, it goes away anyway. But hepatitis, gastroenteritis, uh, these are illnesses that are caused by multiple different infectious agents, and yet they produce exactly the same abnormalities. If you didn't have the test for the infectious agents, you wouldn't know which one was causing it. I think that's what's happening in CFS. I don't think there's a single novel agent, never have. Um, I think that there are a host of them that can do it. Back in 1989, what I said was, um, infectious agents probably can trigger and perpetuate CFS. These agents can't be fully eradicated by the immune system. There is evidence that CFS can follow a new infection, and it's possible that CFS, in CFS, different infectious agents interact to cause the symptoms. So it's not just a single one, but several acting in concert, several that turn each other on. What agents have been linked to CFS? Epstein-Barr virus was the first uh, virus, or the first infectious agent that was tied to this illness. In my judgment, in some patients with CFS, that virus is playing an important role, but not, not in most. A bacterium, or quasi-bacterium, uh, called Coxiella bernetti, uh, is another trigger of this illness. A virus that's found essentially only in Australia, Ross River virus, has demonstrably triggered this illness. The bacterium that causes Lyme disease uh, can trigger this illness. Parvovirus, a group of viruses called enteroviruses, and the virus human herpes virus 6 all have been linked to chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, and I'll show you some of the evidence for that. Two other viruses have been put forward as possible causes of the illness, Borna disease virus and XMRV. Uh, I think, in fact, the evidence in the last few years has pretty well ruled out these two as triggers of CFS. A very important study was done in Australia a few years ago more like 10, 15 years ago, um, supported by the CDC, but conducted in Australia. A group of scientists identified a rural farming community that was surrounded by desert, uh, where everyone who lived in that community got their medical care from the same doctors, same hospital, same laboratories. You literally could know every single person who got sick and what they got sick with in the course of a year, two years, three years. And so they followed every single patient in that community that got infection with Epstein-Barr virus, most of the time causing mononucleosis, Q fever, and Ross River virus. And then they followed those people systematically for 16 months. What they found was that 11% of each of the groups, with each of these three different infectious agents, went on to develop CFS. And that CFS was more likely to occur in those patients who had initially the most severe symptoms and, in whose, and whose immune system was the most activated in producing what are called the inflammatory cytokines. It's the molecules that, as I described earlier, the immune system uses to orchestrate the immune attack. What they also found, importantly, was that CFS was not more likely to develop in patients who have particular psychiatric or demographic uh, factors in the years prior 
to the illness. Enteroviral infection um, has been, I think, fairly dramatically linked to CFS, but only by one investigator in one laboratory, Dr. John Cha. Uh, it's uh, impressive work, but until other people uh, are able to reproduce this work, I think we don't know uh, how solid it is. But in his studies, looking in, he did biopsies of the stomach. And what he found was that when he used markers that cause a brown color uh, to, to enteroviruses in the patients with CFS, he found this evidence of the enteroviral infection much more often than when he used other viral markers, in this case, a virus called cytomegalovirus. So as I say, um, I find it impressive work, but no one has yet reproduced it, and until that happens, we don't know how solid it is. Viruses and CFS. So my current view is very similar, essentially the same as it was when I first spoke here in 1989. I think that infectious agents probably can trigger and perpetuate the illness. I think these are likely to be agents that cannot be fully eradicated by the immune system. There is now solid evidence, whereas in 1989 there was only very weak evidence that chronic fatigue syndrome not only can follow new infections, but commonly does follow a group of uh, infections. And that it's possible that different infectious agents interact to cause symptoms in chronic fatigue syndrome. So, in closing, uh, I would just want to summarize again that there is, I think, in my mind now, solid evidence of underlying biological abnormalities in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Those abnormalities are measurable by scientific techniques. They involve the central nervous system, the brain, and the autonomic nervous system. There is a state of chronic immune activation as if the immune system is trying to attack something. The $64,000 question is what that something is or what they are. Um, there is oxidative stress and a related phenomenon called nitrosative stress uh, in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. This contributes to the, an impairment in the energy metabolism of the cells and that infection can trigger the illness in many, if not all, patients. Still uncertain if it can perpetuate the illness. As for treatments, the sort of the treatments that have been used for 20 years and with anecdotal evidence seem to help are tricyclic drugs. Amitriptyline and doxepin are the two uh, most often used. Another related drug called trazodone. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines uh, can be very useful to deal with the pain of the syndrome, the headaches, the aching muscles, the aching joints. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, a technique used to help patients cope with chronic illnesses of many different kinds, can be helpful in CFS, but not curative. And several studies indicate that very gradual, graded exercise can help, but this has to be done very carefully by experienced therapists because, as many of you know, if you push exercise too hard, it can provoke relapses. I think there are a number of treatments that do not appear to be effective in chronic fatigue syndrome. There are two new treatments in the last few years since I last spoke here in 2010 that um, have attracted a lot of interest. One is a, a drug called rituximab. This is a, a biological therapy. It is a, a monoclonal antibody that is, was developed to be used in certain lymphatic cancers, 
it attacks one kind of white blood cell or immune system cell called B cells. And some lymphatic cancers are cancers of B cells, and that's why this medicine was developed. There is no such cancer in chronic fatigue syndrome patients. But there is plenty of evidence that the B cells in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome are more numerous in number and are more active than in healthy people. And in any event, whatever the rationale for the study, uh, this evidence of B cell activation in chronic fatigue syndrome patients led a group of investigators in Scandinavia to conduct a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial of this treatment, um, and then to assess clinical improvement. And what they found was substantial clinical improvement in nearly 70% of a small group of patients studied compared with only 13% of those that received the placebo. It's a highly significant difference. The response lasted 25 weeks, um, but they didn't conduct the study for a long enough period of time to know how durable the response would be, or if its effect started to wane, whether doing it again would again cause improvement or not. So small study, don't know for how long the improvement uh, would be maintained. But the very encouraging thing was in this small study, there were no adverse effects of treatment. Um, but it begs, it, I mean, it begs for another much larger study that lasts a lot longer in time so that we can get a better sense as to whether this is a realistic uh, therapy to use in chronic fatigue syndrome. I, I regard it as an encouraging study, but we need to know more before, uh, before advocating it. A second study published just a few months ago from uh, Dr. Montoya's lab at Stanford Medical School is of a particular antiviral Valgan cyclovir. This antiviral drug is very effective in the laboratory at killing two viruses that seem in many but not all patients to be reactivated in chronic fatigue syndrome, Epstein-Barr virus and human herpes virus 6. Because those two viruses appear to be or are reactivated in many patients, Dr. Montoya took just those CFS patients who had reactivation of these two viruses and then conducted a randomized controlled double-blind trial of this antiviral drug. Again, it was a small study, like the rituximab study, 30 patients. Um, and, and as I say, it was a subset of people with CFS who had evidence of reactivation of these two viruses. Um, and so it's, he, did, he did not study this treatment in all patients with CFS, only in the subset. But people taking the, the antiviral were more likely to show improvement in most of the measurements that he had specified as part of the study. And again, there were no serious adverse effects of treatment. But you, there are no serious effects seen in 30 people. But you don't want to advocate treatment that has, can have serious side effects in other patients uh, on a large scale until you have a larger study uh, that is more persuasive than this. So I would say these two studies are uh, encouraging because they are the kind of treatment study you have to do. They are randomized controlled trials, and that's the only kind of study of the treatment that's at all persuasive. But they're small, uh, and they didn't follow people for a long time, and so this one needs to be repeated with a lot more patients. So in summary, um, since 1989, in nearly the quarter century since I first spoke to this group, as I see it, chronic fatigue syndrome has moved from a term that a few doctors had heard and about which nothing was known scientifically 
to an illness that virtually all doctors have heard about and nearly half say they see in their practice, uh, and one that has generated thousands of research papers from laboratories all over the world. That, to me, is enormously encouraging. But I, like you, am impatient. Uh, and I don't find that the pace of advance has gone nearly fast enough. We still don't have a definitive diagnostic test, an absolutely proven treatment. Um, but we know an awful lot more about this illness. Uh, and I think that kind of knowledge is bound to lead to diagnostic tests and proven treatments. Thanks very much, and take some questions.